Hello and welcome to the Real Deal Trio podcast, where we dive deep into the world of real estate, business, and personal growth. I'm your host, Yahya Chatani, joined by my esteemed co-hosts, Mohit Badlani and Phil Mariani. Together, we bring you a wealth of knowledge and expertise to help you navigate through the complexities of the real estate market, unlock business success, and cultivate a life of balance and fulfillment. So get ready for insightful conversations, actionable advice, and also a whole bunch of inspiration. So let's dive in. What is up, everyone? What's going on, fellas? What's well, happening, guys? We're, we're What's doing, happening? We're doing oh, a man. back-to-back. Let's do this. Let's, Let's go. Do it. I love it. Yeah, I know we've been talking about interest rates for 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 a little while now, and everybody's been talking about interest rates for a little while. Like I mentioned in the last episode, it's been a thorn on everybody's side for the past year, year and mm-hmm. a half. So uh, we're gonna expand upon that. From our last episode, we talked about a a, a funny quote that's been going on. Uh, what was the quote again, Phil? Date the rate, marry the house. <laughs> there you go. So we, we discussed about that, and we discussed how corny that is. But not only that, how it there's there's two sides to that, right? So there's the in depth side, which Yahya went in depth with, and there's the, the more plain and simple side as well, too. Uh, but uh, so you, uh, we want to give our audience the full perspective, right? So today we're going to be talking a, a little bit more into the numbers, into the finance, into the economy as well, too. So Yaya and and Phil both had exactly the same. Um, oh, what is it? It's not a meme. It's a it's an infograph. So yep, it's I'll, a, it's, I'll show it to you guys. I'll pull it up. I'll pull it up. So it's been it's been very annoying for me. <laughs> so our our video audience who's going to be watching on YouTube and stuff. So if you're listening on uh, audio only, go ahead and uh, uh, check our YouTube out so you can see this infograph. No, I know. Essentially, when, when we left off, we were talking. Uh, you know, I mentioned the Aya, which leading us to our new conversation today is. I th- you know the I think a, a lot of people you know been I guess we're expecting by this point in the year for interest rates for the Feds to drop the rates and having it. So that's kind of where we're where Yaya was going to lead. Yeah, we're going to go into that. Why? Exactly. Yeah, we're going into that. So yeah, yeah, go ahead and tell us what this infograph is about. So the infograph, guys, is this picture that's been going around, which is called the mortgage reality check. And it looks something like this, where, you know, people are posting these photos of, oh, the homes in 1975 rates were 9%, in 1980 they were 15%. So you should be happy rates are, 15, you know, 7%. Honestly, I'm going to go say it, it's the stupidest, dumbest thing I've seen. And anybody that posts this, guys, I got a bone to pick with you. You come and talk to me because I'm a whoop you because it's the what? stupidest thing. What are you thing. talking about? What, what I'm mean? talking about? What do I mean? It's a, cool I mean? Graph. It's, a it's, it's a dumb graph. It's like saying, hey, man, look, homes were at a 10% rate in 1980s. So what's the problem with 7% today? Well, here's the problem. Whoever this person is posting it out there, his homes were not $500,000 back in 1980. They were less than half. So yeah. if you're buying a home at 10% interest, for two fifty versus buying a home at eight nine percent for five hundred thousand dollars in an economy where inflation rates are superbly high, there's less money being made, and people are facing the worst financial crisis in a long time. It's not an equal comparison, man. Like the average income in America is low, average savings are less than five thousand dollars in accounts. Their housing market is going nuts. Like Phil, I mean, I'm sure you know. Like I'm seeing more than five offers per property that I'm working on. And most of my buyers are offering in, in or Florida, by the way, between five to 20 grand over asking. Thankfully, the appraisals are coming in good. In California, I'm helping a borrower. Guys, 40 grand over, 30 grand over. Cash prices with insanity going on there. Like 30, 40 offers. There was one lady and she's like, I have 40 offers. I got to send 40 counter offers. And we have a cash offer multiple ones with above twenty, thirty thousand dollars Was that happening in 1980? No, it was not. Was that happening up to 1990? It was not. So when you compare this, I want to call you guys out on bullshit. It does not happen. Don't post this kind of stuff and confuse the borrower because I'm coming for you. <laughs> now, I can attest, you know, when I when we me and my wife bought our first house, it was like an 8% interest rate. But to agree with you, the purchase price was like around 175000 Right. And, and you could discount the prices. You were getting sellers to pay for closing costs. There was negotiations. You were not on the hook, man. Like, hey, you don't put 30 grand over, you're done. It's like, man, like, how is somebody supposed to, you know, if a property doesn't appraise, what happens? What happens then? As a buyer, I incur, you know, appraisal fees. I incur inspection fees. I put my escrow. And now I'm on the hook if I have no appraisal contingency or whatnot. 
I'm screwed. That's not fair. So I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just getting mad because I feel like it's unfair <laughs> to inform the consumer with this information. So you know what? That's that's just me, man. I was just venting. <laughs> I was pissed. <laughs> no, we got you. Yeah, no, it makes sense. <laughs> so what what do you think, Definitely Phil? I know you had a you had an opinion on that too. What what are your thoughts on that? Uh, no, like I said, you know, uh, I like mentioned when we bought our first house, it was it was eight percent, but again. Um, you know, it was, uh, you know, a quarter of the price was a hundred. I think our first house was about 175,000. And like you said, back then gas was cheaper, you know, um, you know, groceries were cheaper. So, you know, take, you know, inflation wasn't where we're at now. Right. So when you take this all into consideration, you know, most people say, well, but that's a cool, what do you think when people say, yeah, well, that was equivalent though, back then till now, like things are <laughs> equivalent. What do you, what, you know, what are your thoughts when people say that, you know? Yeah. It's like, man, eggs used to be like half the price three years ago you know you can't go to somebody and be like hey listen walmart i'm paying you five dollars for 30 eggs that shit does not fly but importantly though phil you brought up a good point bro you said that you know last episode we left our audience hanging as to why rates have been the way they've been so i'm gonna dive into some boring data for you guys so you kind of see what's happening right so the fed looks at two measures of inflation one is the cpi which is the consumer price index, and one is the PCE, which is their favorite measure of inflation, which is normally misleading, is the uh, personal consumption expenditure. And when you look at these numbers, they decide, okay, are we going to increase the rate or reduce the rate? And they decide that by what the inflation numbers are saying. Now, a lot of times these reports are lagging, they're not 100% accurate, but they do give us a pretty good picture as to what's happening in the economy. And when these numbers are running warm or hot as right now, it is an indication for the Fed to not lower the rate. And tomorrow, by the way, April 26th, we're recording it today a little early, but 26th of April is when the Federal Reserve is hoping for an alternative measure that comes in cooler. And the PCE price deflator that they're looking at is showing a weaker inflation than the CPI. And if that comes in lower, it will be a little bit of relief for our buyers which is what I'm waiting for personally to lock my loans because we've been seeing some of these craziness. And uh, if anybody's into trading or you look at charts, we're at a bit of a trading, uh, I would say it's a, uh, I forgot the term suddenly, it's a range. We're in a range where we have a support and a resistance level, which is pretty tight. And the bond pricing is just jumping in between it. And something needs to happen. Typically, if you're trade stocks, you trade currencies, whatever you trade, right before a move, that happens. You see a loss or you see a gain and it just keeps shaking in there and then suddenly it goes the other way. So we're hoping that these numbers come in a little bit better and tomorrow the Fed announces what they're going to announce based on that. So we might see some relief, but if inflation does come in lower, you can expect rate cuts, but they're not going to be that soon. They're still going to wait a couple of months. So we also had March's robust retail sales that came in, which kind of offset us. So when retail sales and all these things come up better, it also pushes inflation higher, which means the American consumer is showing to be stronger than that was expected. People are still buying. They're still shopping. And to give you an idea, the non-store sales, which are online I think online that's what sales, happened last month. Yeah. I think that's like, what happened last month. Yeah. Exactly. Non-store sales went up by 2.7%. So, you know, we're waiting for inflation to come down, the economy to weaken, but the data is coming in the other way. So that's what's pushing us in this bind. But like Phil said in our previous episode, guys, if you are buying a home and you feel like it's a great property, you're getting a lot of equity, the appraisal is coming in higher, you're financially able to afford it, I would say make that move. Because as these inflation numbers come down and the rates start to come down, right. based on data, every 1% uh, interest rate coming down increases about half a million more buyers into the market. So with inflation, you know, with, with competition so stiff right now, imagine 500,000 more buyers who are ready, able, and willing to buy, what that's going to do to the market. Right. I mean, essentially, right, it'll be more buying power, more buying power to buyers. It will push them off the fence to buy. And now you have multiple people looking at the same property, which again, could lead us to multiple offer situations. Now where the seller is not as flexible as they are at the moment with either price decreases or helping and sell concessions to the buyer to, to uh, close on the home. These are the things we're experiencing right now, which are helping buyers. But so that's why I say, you know, don't try to time the market. It's a losing battle. If you're in a position to buy and it's affordable, you can afford it. Purchase now, you know, whenever the rates, if and when they do come down with this one year, two years, whatever, whatever it is, you know, then you can always look at refinancing, getting a cheaper payment at that point. And then at the same time, you know, work on building some equity, right? 
Yep. And guys, check out this contrast. So, you know, we talk about investors coming and buying properties and they're still being 30% of the market, guys. So this is making a pretty big disparity for buyers and renters where it's very scary to look at this because the way it's going, most of the population may not be able to afford a home. Check this stat out. The difference between renting and buying a home has hit a record high in favor of renting due to soaring home prices and rising mortgage rates. Somebody looking to purchase the average home today with a 10% down payment would have a mortgage of $2,200 versus a $1,500 to rent the average home. And rent stands to stay cheaper for most folks for a number of years, although borrowing costs should drop from where they are right now, but they're unlikely to fall substantially over the next few years. Meanwhile, a solid price growth, a so, sorry, meanwhile, a solid house price growth and a rising supply of rental units is pointing to a sizable gap between buying and renting. So, you know, if you don't buy a home now, the contrast might put you out of the market for the next couple of years. Right. So I know it, and I'm not trying to make anybody feel like, oh my God, we have to buy it. Don't do that. If it's not a good decision, please talk to a financial advisor, your mortgage lender, somebody who's an expert to understand. But use this as a gauge to think. If you don't buy, you might be renting for quite some time. So it might be that right time to cut back on those Starbucks and Chick-fil-A's and Panera's and, you know, take a little bit of money back and invest in your future. Now, what do you think of this? If I throw this question at you. So let's just say, you know, it is cheaper than rent right now. But now once, you know, that turns, okay, and uh, let's just say people are forced to have to rent. Now, do you think because now there's an influx of renters that maybe landlords will tend to raise uh, raise rental rates as well. Absolutely, man. I mean, right? don't get me bad, but I'm a businessman, dude. Right. And, you know, if, if mortgage prices are 2200 bucks and I'm renting it out for 15 and I see the ability to raise, I'm not trying to kill anybody. But look, I got rising costs too. I got management fee I got to pay. My management company is going to charge me more because they're going to see that. The HOA, if I'm living in one, is going to charge me higher. My taxes are going to go up next year. I'm going to incur more costs too. So I got to look out for myself here, right? So I, yeah. it's it's a pretty scary sight to know. Plus, more investors are buying homes to rent out. And real estate investors bought about 18% of all the homes in the fourth quarter of 2023. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> here's my question to you. Now you, now, you, know, you say, hey, you're going to raise the rent on me. Well, I'm going to go across the street because the guy with the, has the same house is also renting because everybody's renting now, right? So that builds competition. Now, mm -hmm. if you're going to raise your rent from twenty two hundred to three thousand on me, the other guy across the street has the same floor plan, same everything. I'm going to go to him because he's going to be at twenty four hundred. He might not be as low as you, but then you're going to be like, oh shit! Now I have a lot of this competition around me. If you look in Florida, apartments are fucking coming up left and right, and we have an eleven percent vacancy rate, which is higher than the rest of the nation, which I, th I think is around like seven point five vacancy rate. So this was a it's thing um, much we talked about. I think I talked about it with somebody last year. And this was an expectation. This was a prediction, you can say, that with the amount of apartments that are coming up, there's going to be a grave amount of vacancy in those units. Because the thing is, people don't like apartments as much. A lot of families prefer single family homes. That's where the money's at. So if I'm an investor, I am not buying an apartment. I don't want to deal with no HOAs. Don't want to deal with those people. Keep your condos, keep your apartments, guys. I don't care. I'm buying single family homes. Three, to four, three bedroom, two bathroom on average, no more than 15 right. to 1,800 square feet. That's the sweet spot, man. I'm telling you. Spot, yeah. I rent that thing. It's on fire. <laughs> I'm not doing no condos, man. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, these we, are not we have condos. Those. You're talking about these are apartment buildings that are coming up left and right around here. They're like full on units and they're they're sitting at 11% vacancy. Even single family homes in Winter Garden, we have 161 uh, single family homes ready to rent move in next day same day i mean what's going on with all even even as hot as the market we have right we still have so, this vacancy so you could tell me this so you guys Why? you guys work on rentals too right leasing apartments about 100 that, applications no, no. come in how many applicants actually qualify you know the crazy thing guys i can qualify somebody for a mortgage faster than i can for a rental oh yeah it's, it's, it, this is, it blows my mind. Like I was looking at, I was sitting with a property manager buddy of mine and we're looking at it. I'm like, Oh, let me just have a fun activity to do here. Let me see all the applications and I'll see which one I can qualify. I could qualify more than 50% of those people for a mortgage, literally. 
if they made a couple of changes. But on the rental side, it was harder to qualify them because it's very there's no underwriting, there's none, there's no guidelines, right? So what people don't get is that to buy a home like programs like USDA, FHA, VA, even like Fannie Mae has this home ready program where they're giving a twenty five hundred dollar grant towards closing for low income folks. So you you have so many benefits to home ownership like we talk about, but because the average consumer has no idea, and most most lenders, for example, in my, let's say, industry, don't know what they're doing. They don't look at it. They don't learn. They've been doing this for 10 years. That's all they know. And that's all they've been doing. There's no progression. People don't spend time learning, reading, understanding what's going on, stretching themselves. So that's where when you compare the rent versus buy, yeah, it, it, there's a reason why they're empty because you have so many strict regulations. Oh, you have to make three times the income. Okay. But what, is there any leaving? Oh, you have to have a 650 credit score. You have to have this. You have to have that. Okay. What if I don't? And what I've seen is for, for rent by owners are a lot more flexible. They don't ask for three times the rent. They're like, okay, give me two. All right. I'll charge you first, last, and deposit. If you don't have the income, it's fine. I'll do month to month. So a lot of these you know, renters that are being rented directly through the homeowners are getting more success now than what I'm seeing through property management because it cuts out the cost. You don't have to pay anybody. Yeah. Yeah, and I can relate. You know, we have uh, me and my wife. We have a townhouse, which is an investment property for us that we, you know, we manage ourselves. And uh, but, like you mentioned earlier, um, we do have rising costs because it's an investment property. It's not a homesteaded property, so the, you know, the uh, they can raise the, you know, the property taxes higher than normal on a homestead versus a homesteaded property. HOAs have gone up, so you know, uh, homeowners insurance went up, so these, you know, fees do go up. So what do we got to do? We have to. You know, raise the uh, yeah time to raise the rent in order to you know at least you know make sure we cover our costs. You know, yeah, and it's not just so much profit; it's just staying in business, man. Like I gotta be able to afford my payment for you to right. be able to rent the home. Mm -hmm. That's that's the majority of times why you know uh, landlords are raising rent because of their expenses are, are being mm -hmm. raised. You know, so we have to make sure that we're at least covering that, right? So, fun fact, guys, a little dirty secret here. I always look at this tool that is on the MLS, which is called IMAP, to look at pre-foreclosures just to see what's happening out there. Because we try to help you know people that are going through that so they can at least have a plan of action. And majority of these are owned by LLCs. It's former, it's investors who made some bad calls, made some bad decisions, and they are going into foreclosure now for their properties. So it, Unfortunately, when you know even investors don't know what they're doing, sometimes people make mistakes, things happen, bad calls, right? You see that. So if they don't raise their rents, they have no way to pay their mortgage and hold that property. So it is, it's a pretty, you know, wild sword. And that's why there's a need to talk to people who know what they're doing. Like, for example, Phil, Mo, you guys have been doing this for so long. You know, and the reason why we're here is so we can educate our community, like, hey, talk to us, you know, ask questions. Cause that's what's gonna put you in a better position, especially in a market right now with all these crazy things with NAR and all this that's happening, the value of a true professional is more important than ever. What do you guys think of that? Absolutely. You got it. Yeah, it's all about, you know, educating the consumer. That's where the value is at. These fucking rates need yeah. to go down. Let, let everybody <laughs> Listen, live. Come on, man. That's what I'm saying. We just need a little <laughs> bit of relief just so we can, you know, pick things up. Let's and relieve this pressure. That, that do want to buy. So, you know, just a little relief is all I'm looking for. All right, guys. Great discussion today. Great, great, uh, yeah, so, great, uh, great discussion. Great points. Yeah, yeah. So we'll be back next uh, week with some, uh, with some, uh, with some new topics some and new we topics. Can discuss some uh, some cool stuff about Florida. Yeah. All right, guys. I'll That's see you guys right, next everybody. week. All right, guys. Thanks a lot. Thank you for joining us today on the Real Deal Trio podcast, where we dive deep into the exciting worlds of real estate, business, and mastering that sweet life balance. If you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. Your feedback helps us continue delivering content that matters to you. Stay pumped for our upcoming episodes, jam-packed with expert insight, game-changing strategies, and Florida real estate. For more exclusive contents and behind the scene action, follow us on Facebook, search for The Real Deal Trio group page, and for Instagram at The Real Deal Trio Pod. And for YouTube, search for The Real Deal Trio Podcast. We will have all these links to our social media account and some more in the description. We would love to be your go to experts for all your real estate needs in Florida. Shoot us an email, realdealtrio at gmail.com.
Until next time, keep balancing the hustle, the deals, and the moments that make life truly extraordinary. This is the Real Deal Trio Podcast, signing off.